Good afternoon, everyone. Well done for lasting this long, and I hope I can keep you awake for the next 15 to 20 minutes. I'll try and keep it short and sweet. So biological interactions are very important to understand, especially on the rocky shores where it's a stressful environment. It can determine which species occur on certain areas of the rocky shore. And knowing the interactions will give you a better idea of the dynamics and what's happening and what might happen in the future. I'm looking at epibiosis, which is a state where an organism lives on the surface of another. And there are many marine examples. There's a list there, many bacteria, protozoa, diatoms, most of the macroalgae, sponges, and the list goes on. There's some examples. All those little critters live on a sea snake, and there's some barnacles making life pretty uncomfortable for that little chap. So the effects on a basibiont, which is the host organism, or the one that's being settled on, could be negative, such as shading, uh, increased weight, which will cause, cause drag, uh, access to dissolved molecules in the water column, and shared doom, which involves predation and a predator coming for either the epibiont or the host organism, and the other one taking the fall with it. But it could also be positive. Um, it could add defense to the basibiont, camouflage, also similar, and physical protection, such as from harmful irradiation. When effects are mutually positive, you would think that selection should favor attraction by the basibiont and then settlement specificity by the epibiont. With this in mind, my research question is, is the epibiotic relationship between muscles and barnacles a neutral, a neutral mutualistic, or parasitic one? And some of what I'm looking at actually follows on from work that Timbisa did at Rhodes as well. The species I'm looking at, we've heard a bit about Perna Perna already, very widespread and common on the low shore in most areas of the southern and eastern coast. Uh, Mytilus is the invasive. I'll just call it Mytilus from now on because Gallo Provincialis is a bit of a mouthful. And it first was noticed in South Africa in 1970, but since 1990 has spread about 1,000 kilometers along the south coast. And there's just a basic um, map of the distribution, brown being the Perna Perna and the blue lines being the Mytilus. The sites that I've been going to and using for various aspects that I'm looking at to assess this relationship um, extend from Port Elizabeth on your right-hand side, over here, and then I have adjacent open coast sites for every bay site, so Jeffreys Bay, St. Francis Bay there, and Plettenberg Bay, Kierbaumstrand is my site within the bay there. One of the aspects I'm looking at is a general intensity and prevalence. So this is looking at um, numbers of muscles mostly. Intensity, though, is the amount of the individual muscle covered by barnacles. Oh, and the barnacle species I'm looking at is mostly thalamus, dentatus, but I am also considering the other main barnacles that you find, octomerus and tetraclita species. So for the intensity and prevalence, I looked at four different zones, low, mid, high, those all are the muscle zones, and then upper being to look at the prevalence of barnacles and the available space for them to settle. And I took scrapings to confirm the prevalence and to assess the intensity. These are just preliminary results, so I can't put my head on a block about it, but there's an example of the type of um, data I'm getting uh, intensity, so uh, one being low infestation, not many barnacles per muscle, and four being very high. You can see there's a lot of muscles with between zero and 20% covered, but then it decreases as, the, as I look at higher infestation levels. But then when it comes to prevalence, looking at the different species, so I've included... Perna and Mytilus. 
You can see Perna is often more infested, well, more numbers are infested, but you have to take into various things such as those zones because Mytilus occurs in the higher zones whereas Perna is in the lower zones. Another aspect is condition, and this is what follows on from some of the work that Tembisa did. This, I'm using condition index, which is a percentage of dry weight soft tissue over dry shell weight, and a higher condition index would suggest a healthier individual. As you can see, the, for both the species, there doesn't seem to be much correlation, so even where there's a high percentage, cut, well, not that high, but between 10 and 15 percent, there doesn't seem to be much difference to the no cover or non-infested muscles. And the same for mitless. Slight trend, but um, it's not significant. Well, that one snuck in. Uh, I'm doing a temporal study, and here I still have to do quite a bit of analysis. But for this, I took repeated photographs. I went back I went to two sites, both within bays, for 12 months, taking photos of the same area each month. Here I've just shown um, sort of months apart so that you can actually see the difference a bit more clearly. And you can see these got washed away, that big mass there, but it's starting to come back. And this gives a realistic um, sense of success, also showing the competition for space, so whether ultimately muscles or barnacles are um, succeeding for settlement. On to settlement, and I feel like Justin set me up nicely here as well. Um, however, this is barnacles. So I wanted to look at it from both sides. Not only is it harming or benefiting the muscle, but are barnacles showing any preference or some sort of choice? So for this, I set up four treatments. Uh, live muscle, dead muscle, uh, resin replica, and a control, which was just a rock-like substratum. And for four months, I would go and also once a month take photos to monitor the um, survival and the initial settlement. This took quite a bit of preparation, making molds of actual muscle shells so that the resin replicas would be the same topography, but just no, not a living substratum, um, keeping the live muscles alive until I could glue them down and ship them off back to plet. Then the time in the sun and hard work, but uh, we managed to get it done eventually, all while racing the tide, which is forever chasing you. So that's something to consider. Just to give you an idea of what they look like, that's a live muscle. You can see the Bissell threads there, which they use for attachment. And here I was only looking at Perna because it was more um, for the barnacles side of the story. That's a dead muscle glued together and then glued down onto the plate. That's a resin replica. That is after a few months, so don't take this as initial settlement. And that's the control. Some of the data so far, um, you can see a highly significant difference between the treatments here. Uh, this has been adjusted as well because obviously that um, is a lot larger area than a muscle. So I've adjusted the numbers to show better representation. And it's highly significantly different. And then um, the replica also significantly different from the others. And then live and dead, both low initial settlements. So these are primary settlers at time event one. These are essentially months at the bottom. So that was at Beacon Isle, which is a site in Plettenberg Bay. And then a similar pattern for Kierboom Strand, but this shows a bit more clearly at the later times where the primary settled settlers are still appearing. This does, you have to remember though that of course these ones are all growing, so there's limited space as the months went by. So generally this is what we're pretty much seeing. Um, in this instant, 
the replica was not significantly different from the live and dead, but was quite close. And then the control even adjusted much higher than the others. So just to summarize these results, there seems to be a negative effect of barnacles on mitilus, um, on the growth rate that is, but on the overall condition there seems to be no effect. This might change with further analysis, um, adding in size and various other factors. Perna perna, sorry that shouldn't be a capital on the second word there. These effects appear to be neutral, so it makes no difference to a perna muscle whether they have barnacles or don't have barnacles. And this could also be indicative of the attachment strength, because mitilus um, occurs on the higher part of the rocky shore, mostly because they have lower attachment strength. So they may need to invest more energy into attachment strength, and that's why their growth rates are slightly slow. And then from the barnacles side, they do show a preference for a rock-like substratum. <clears throat> and this could, this shows that the muscles are probably a secondary choice when other space is occupied. And this brings us back to the issue of space on the rocky shore. Things I need to think about. Um, this will be included in my discussion. Things like microtopography, so this is a study done by Burse and Will, and that's not a Mitilus gala provincialis, but a similar species. So looking at the actual um, topography of the shell and whether they may have evol evolved to deter settlers, although if there's no negative effect, you would think probably not. Those are just SEM images. Orientation, things like angle to the sun and shading. Microhydrodynamics, so how water currents move around the muscle and if that changes with barnacles attached to it. Also then increasing drag. Anti-fouling strategies, are there any chemicals released by the muscles to prevent epibionts in general? Um, predation, so on the muscles I often actually found uh, species of what's now afro litorana and limpets grazing on the muscles, so that could have something to do with it. And to consider conspecifics as well, where one barnacle settles, others are, um, tend to settle there afterwards. So just conclusions for mitilus as an invasive species. It has already been shown that mitilus is limited on the South African coast by climate because they are limited to temperate zones and by coexisting with perna. They don't seem to be out-competing perna, which is a good thing. But then my research has shown that they're probably further limited by barnacles um, and probably through growth as well. And I'm hoping to see that in my temporal study where I'll follow individual muscles that are either infested or non-infested and see how long they survive on the rocks for. Thank you very much. We've got five minutes until half past. So, Jennifer, you want to start? Thank you, Caroline. Um, I just wanted to find out the way you were um, gluing them to your plates. Were you putting them flat? Um, surely the orientation, I mean, they live up. Uh, do you think, I mean, what kind of influence did the gluing have? Well, I did take that into consideration, and I was going to try a sort of angled effect with putty, and there were various methods that I would have tried. Um, I was worried about them because it can often be quite rough down in those areas getting washed away and then not actually having anything. So it was sort of a bit of a compromise that I realized they're not at a natural angle, but I was also just looking at the substratum for the barnacles. So ideally I would have liked to put them within a muscle bed so that they had um, the effect of other muscles around them and that sort of thing but just for practicality and them getting washed away, I had to put them flat down. Any other questions? 
Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Caroline.